Midway is the punk rock, you know, they're like the Ramones or the Sex Pistols of the video game industry. If their game became very successful, you were gonna make a lot of money. Keeps on fire! I'd buy that for a dollar! I always thought with video games when you make them, somebody would come with this book. This is what we're gonna make and we start page one and we start making it. It was never like that. It was like, so what do you guys wanna do? The games are louder. The graphics are more detailed. More, more blood, more blood. Toasty! What game does that? They've got this game, Mortal Kombat, and you can kill people. Yeah, isn't that really cool? What the hell? <laughs> we can do whatever we want. We wanted to crush the player. We want to give them a greater challenge. I'm a la vista, baby. This is probably the greatest story of Midway. I call it like the Big Bang of the video game universe. I mean, we went from blank screens to all of a sudden, no one had seen anything like that in the video game. We went to the well too many times. And that was the end of Quaynum. We're going to sue the crap out of him. I don't think it hit me till decades later that my image is still in there. I have daughters now, they're gonna see this. Sometimes I'd sneak up behind him, guy would take a shot and I'd go, ugly shot, boom shakalaka. He'd turn around and go, hey, you sound like the guy. I am the guy, dude. I remember thinking to myself, wow, I'm working with gods. Mark T2, the grid. You know what a game is? A game is a hundred of those cool things, and now you have one. We've got the godfather, the doctor of video games. Uh, what do you call yourself? Ah, uh, face. <laughs> <laughs> That's, a wrap. That's good. That's a wrap. Hey, everybody! Welcome to the making of Insert Coin with director Josh Sway. Thank you guys so much for showing up today. My name is Rayon Ali. I am the writer of NBA Jam the Book. And I am joined by not only the director of this documentary, not only the editor, but also somebody who has incredible credits when it comes to Midway Games, which, you know, the, the movie stuff is cool and all, but we're talking to right now somebody who is not only an NBA Jam Tournament Edition secret character and also an NHL Open Ice secret character. I see your shirt. That's very nice. But also, we're talking to Sub Zero in Mortal Kombat 2's ending. And for me personally, my favorite, Liu Kang in Mortal Kombat 4. Josh, how are you? Good. Thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, quite the intro there. Just going through my, uh, my greatest hits on Midway. Exactly, exactly. The accolades. I mean, Liu Kang in particular, that is that image of that Liu Kang is seared into my mind. So it's crazy that I'm talking to Liu Kang right now. I still geek out when it comes to stuff like that. I'm like, I'm talking to Liu Kang. At least that Liu Kang. Um, but yeah, so um, so in the event that you're not familiar with Josh's work, Josh is a game industry veteran. He's had stints at, of course, Midway, Activision, EA, uh, Studio Gigante, um, and then of course there was Robomoto. Um, what else? What else am I missing? What where else have you been, Josh? Oh, I'm sure you've been other places. Uh, so yeah, I think I think you got the you got all of them right now at this point. All the biggest hits. Yeah. 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 Um, I've been lucky enough to. You know, working in quite a few different um, studios in Chicago, and also formed you know a couple of studios. So yeah, it's uh, it's been super fun. An incredible ride, yeah. Um, so yeah, so now you've been working on Insert Coin, which just to uh, to put the disclaimer out there. So of course, so I'm kind of in this position right now, interviewing you as the person who you know knows some stuff about this because of writing the NBA Jam book. But first and foremost, I'm a fan of your work, and I'm a Kickstarter starter backer too. So I've been following Insert Coin and. I'm super excited about it. Um, so yeah, so just as in terms of the the basic synopsis, of course, the Midway is about '90s, or rather, the movie is about '90s Midway. But what is like the the elevator pitch? What is the introduction to Insert Coin if somebody's not familiar with the project? So I mean, so basically, um, you know, some people may or may not know. I actually um, went to film school, and I originally meant to do film school. Uh, I meant I meant to make movies as a living. Uh, and I kind of got into video games by accident. And so much like many people of that era, they thought that they were going to get into video games for a couple of years and they kind of go out and do other things. Tobias has the same story. He thought he was going to do John Tobias, co-creator of Mortal Kombat. So basically, um, you know, he, you know, I thought I was going to get into film. I got into video games, love making video games and ended up getting stuck in it for like, you know, 20 plus years. And, uh, and after a while, uh, around 19, I'm sorry, around 2014, 
um, I just realized that, man, I've been in games for a long time, and if I don't make at least one film in my life, I'm going to regret it. And so I thought to myself, you know what? Nobody's ever done a holistic documentary of this whole era of Midway Games. I was very intimate with the subject, obviously. I knew everybody. And it, it just felt like a good, low-hanging fruit for a subject matter for, for a first-time filmmaker. Okay. Well, going along with that, though, so, of course, you've got the whole arcade aspect of Midway. But before we get really deep into what Midway was, tell me about your childhood, at least in terms of the showboat games and golf over in Arcadia, California, which I was reading about, which was your childhood arcade, right? Yeah, uh, so that's that's an interesting thing. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a complete arcade rat, and I grew up <laughs> I grew up in a, uh, in a town called Arcadia in California. So, like, that's how crazy I am about arcades. Uh, my brothers, oh, wait a second, try reselecting. Uh, somebody just sent me something here. I'm gonna keep going. But so, so basically what happened is that, um, my brothers ended up managing this uh, arcade called Showboat Golf and Games. I was part of Malibu Grand Prix in Southern California. And with the, you got to race in like little mini Indy cars. And Showboat was a three-story Mark Twain boat full of arcade games. And you got to remember, this is the late 70s, early 80s, <laughs> arcade boom and such. And so they used to babysit me for like 12 hours with a sack of tokens. And that's all I would do all day. So I got to know arcade games like extremely well because of that. So what were the games? What was what really hooked you in? What reeled you in? Um, I mean, you know, I love boy. Yeah, I know your typical games like Pac-Man things like that. But I really love vector games. So I love mm. oh rip off Omega Rays. You know, I thought those were fantastic. Um, Asteroids and uh, and I love Missile Command. And that wasn't a vector game, but that was one of my favorite games also. So I, you know, I had arcade games like really in my blood. I mean, I you know, to this day, those are still the types of games that I prefer. Yeah, you've worked on a ton of games in your career, but you've never worked on a vector game, have you? No, I haven't. And I've always like it's funny. I was I've always wanted to do one. And uh, like my favorite console out of all the console generated is still the Vectrex because it just felt it was just as good as what you would get in an arcade. Yeah. That's the real thing. Yeah. I've always always wanted a Vectrex. Never got to actually play one, but man, they look so cool. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so let's go back to let's let's really focus on the beginnings of your work with Midway. So your first yeah. game at Midway, tell me about getting into the company and the first game that you worked on, what ho that whole onboarding experience was like back in the day. Yeah, it was like it was like Lord of the Flies. It was very little management. Um and, and like you know, each team was about, you know, five, maybe six people large and it's because there were arcade games you know arcade games they were much smaller in scope than um than a lot of the uh you know a lot of games that you would see nowadays and so we didn't have producers everybody was a game developer and uh and even game design docs were very minimal at the time so a lot of times we were making things up i was going along and just kind of felt the game as we we're developing them and that's where you get you know a lot of these inspirational ideas that was definitely one of the things I found out when I was researching NBA Jam is that, oh, you know, the on fire mode wasn't necessarily planned or the crazy dunks weren't planned or, you know, all of these kinds of things weren't planned. That was just one of the most spectacular things to me about Midway, too, is the fact that you guys are just like, yeah, let's run with it. Let's do something. Um, now, with that, though, OK, so when you arrive over there, the arcades are still really at a peak. Now, at that point, did Midway have any kind of aura of confidence about it, knowing that they were the ones that people were coming to for the games? You know, claim was coming to me to for this, not vice versa. Yeah, so I mean, back then, you know, Williams um, already had a pretty big reputation. Like when I came to Midway, like I was, I wasn't thinking about it so much as Midway. I thought to myself, I'm like, God, I'm working for the company that made Defender and Robotron mm. and things like that. And so, uh, so that really got me excited. I think a lot of people who worked at Midway in the '90s, that era, had that mindset. We were, you know, we remember these games that Eugene Jarvis created. And so that's um, so that's what brought a lot of people over. And so you know, so there was already a, a certain bit of prestige. Now I didn't know at the time that there was a slump that Williams had, you know, in the late '80s and leading into the '90s, up until Eugene came back with NARC and then just kind of exploded the whole digitization era of Midway Games. Um, but it was neat to to kind of ride that wave that as you know as NARC came in and then you had high impact football and then Smash TV and, and leading up to Mortal Kombat, um, you know, it was, it was great to be a part of that, just seeing like, whoa, like, you know, we're really coming back strong now. 
Yeah. So there was that Wild West element, but was there any kind of oversight going on or anybody chiming in as the game started to get more successful? I mean, you know, Mortal Kombat starts off as yep. a kind of a small project, and then, yep. of course, it explodes. NBA Jam is something that's just this arcade game, and then it becomes this yep. huge franchise. So there's cl clearly a lot of money involved, a lot of people involved. Was there? Do you ever find oversight increasing over time, or was it yeah. always the Wild West until about when you left? It, it, so it's funny. It was always a bit of the Wild West, but you can see it um, starting, the management starting to creep in. Uh, but for the most part, if you you know if you were working on certain teams, you had a lot less oversight than other teams. And so, so at, at any given time, there were like maybe four or five different teams at Midway, you know, at the same time. And in the early days, very you know the oversight was very light across the board. As things became more and more successful, the really successful teams were kind of still left alone, but the other teams were under heavier scrutiny. And so things started polarizing quite a bit you know, over time. Um, but like I left in 99 and even then, the, it, you know, the management oversight was still fairly light when you compare it to like most development companies nowadays. But then as you get into the um, the console era, which is into the 2000s, that's where it almost boomeranged too much around the other way around. Yeah. Well, you know, of course, Midway, they transitioned over to the home games just I think it was 2000, 2001 or so. Yep. Uh, maybe 2002, yeah. But you know, in the early 90s, still in that golden age, did they have any kind of inkling that they would eventually be changing as a company, or were they just always, always and forever arcade to the bone? Boy, that's a good question. The you know, I think towards you know around 98, 99, I think people saw the writing on the wall. You, you know, it was kind of inevitable, inevitable that it was going to go more and more into consoles. But you know, arcade is in is in midway DNA, and so. There was a lot of struggle going into the home uh, um, into the home market, and you know, going into the two thousands, um, I think even going even when Midway started basically doing primarily home games, their style was still very arcade like. So it took a long time for them to kind of shake that off of them, and those are huge growing pains, you know, all the way to be honest with you, all the way into the era or, or to the point where you know they went into bankruptcy. Um, so, and it's, it's because, you know, in general, there were a lot of new people at Midway in the 2000s, but there were still a lot of the old guard around. And there was like a constant struggle in terms of style between the two. Yeah. Well, how about the, the increasing competition between teams or at least the increasing competition between games as in there's only limited space on the arcade floor. Yep. And, you know, of course there's only so many games that Midway is going to put out and they're always saying, you guys need to put out these games, you know, you guys need to put out these games. And of course, everybody wants a hit. Yeah. So, of course, there was that camaraderie aspect to Midway as they were doing whatever they wanted. Um, not whatever they wanted, but a lot of things that seemed what they wanted. Um, but how about the competition aspect? So that's one thing that I, I kind of got the vibe is that it kind of increased over time. And, of course, there was still a camaraderie, but that sort of yeah. gained some momentum. So, like, for example, just using the example of uh, Terminator 2, which was, mm -hmm. I think, sold something like 10,000 cabinets, which was a huge number at the time. Yeah. And then, of course, Mortal Kombat comes along and blows that number out of the water. Yeah. And then NBA Jam comes along, and then Mortal Kombat 2 comes along, and so forth. So what was the reaction, or rather, what was the interplay between the teams like? How did they react to the fact that, you know, everybody was topping everybody else? Was it always everybody's on the same team, or was there competition? So in, in the early days, when the, you know, when the fame was still first starting to come in, um, it, there was a lot of camaraderie. People were helping each other out, you know. It's like, you know, the guys from the MK team would help out the NBA Jam team on graphics and so on, you know, back and forth. Um, you know, where it got a little dicey was when basically people got really successful and started getting these incredibly huge royalty checks. And so once that came around, then people were like, oh, wait a second. Like if I make a fighting game, I can make this much more money. And so suddenly you had a company that was making multiple fighting games or multiple sports games. And on the surface, everyone was kind of cool to each other, but underneath, you know, that's like, hey, what, you know, why are these guys doing a hockey game? We're the sports guys. They're just making a hockey version of Jam and stuff. How's that going to eat into my, you know, into, eat into my money? And so that stuff like that starts festering and starts growing. And in all honesty, that's the way management ran the company. You know, it was a very old school New York style of management of everybody has an entrepreneurial nature. You're left to yourself. You go and do the business. It doesn't matter if the person, if the team next to you has the same game or not. Whoever wins, wins. 
And that's right. Yeah. And so again, it, it worked up to a certain point, but it started to really, uh, as the, as the business grew larger and larger and people became very successful, um, it started becoming a bit of a cancer in the, uh, in the organization. Yeah. Um, well, let's pull back to the movie again. So sure. give me an idea of how many interviews you did. So, and, and who's in the cast? Cause there's some pretty big names. Yeah, so I think you know it. Boy, I'm uh, trying to remember. I think I probably had interviewed somewhere between like, you know, I don't know, like 25, 26 people all together. Um, but I always knew that it was going to concentrate on like a, a core group of like five or six people. Um, but you know, as a first time documentarian, I just you know I wanted to kind of spread a wide canvas out and talk to as many people as possible because I ca I knew the story midway, obviously having lived through it. But I wanted to make sure that you know, there might be things I wasn't aware of. And so I, I talked to a lot more people than I thought I was going to, um, which I think helped the story a lot because I came in with a certain preconception and what ended up in the final film was maybe 60% of it. And then there was another 40% that I discovered um, along the way as I was interviewing people. So a good example is, you know, Neil Nicastro, who was the CEO of Midway um, at the time, all the way up until, you know, Warner Brothers took it over. And... And basically, the um, you know, he's never been interviewed about this before. And it, you know, for myself, a lot of people don't know him, but for myself, it was quite the coup to to be able to get him. You know, so yeah. I was super excited about that. Um, but in, like another person is Ernest Klein, who wrote Ready Player One. You know, I literally cold tweeted him to ask him if he would like you know sit down with me, and I showed him the trailer. You know, and he. DM me and just like, yeah, man, let's talk. Come on down to Austin. We'll talk for a couple of hours and stuff. And he was amazing. And you know, people like that, I wasn't planning on getting into the film, but they really helped structure the you know, the the overall tone of it. That's awesome. I really think that people have such a love for Midway that still comes out. I mean, like, there's certain things that you know, people like, oh boy, Midway, they'll like, they'll jump on it, like yeah. you know, and. You know, I really tried to, so when I was working on the book, I tried to do some research. It sounds weird, but I try to find people who hate NBA Jam. <laughs> people who like hate NBA Jam, they're like, they think it's garbage. Yep. They think, you know, it should not have been a game, this or that. And it is legitimately really hard to find serious critics of the game. Yeah. And the same thing goes for a lot of those classic midway games too, where they're kind of like almost like an amber. Like, you know, they're, they're often their own place where, you know, people see them at barcades, they freak out. Yeah. People see them at... You know, they 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 see some kind of revival happening. There's all this excitement. Um, do, you know, have you found that that just it being midway has opened doors? Yeah, no, definitely. I it, it's it actually surprised me a lot when I when I started doing this doc and you know talked to various people about it that how much people like people love the arcade games in general, but midway in the '90s was like a very special group of games, very special group, a very special time. And so a lot of these people, it was amazing to me. Like, you know, they're obviously older now. And when I talked to them, they're like, oh man, that was my childhood. That was my, my college days. You know, all my quarters went into that. And they remember those games. They don't remember too many of the other games of that era, to be quite honest with you. You got, yeah. you know, you got Street Fighter and, and a lot of the Capcom fighting games and there's certain other games, but it, it's always like games from the eighties, like Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, things like that. And then it jumps right into Midway's 90s games and it's a lot of stuff in between. Yeah, you have some people remembering it, but they're they're a little bit harder, you know, for them to remember. They, they're yeah, like you said, it's like the NBA Jam Mortal Kombat is like an amber in terms of like, oh, that was my college days. That's all I did was I studied and played NBA Jam. You know exactly. Yeah. Also, NBA Jam has just become uh, just kind of the trade word for any kind of arcade style basketball game. Like I've seen yeah. NBA Hang Time, NBA Showtime, other yeah. ones referred to as NBA Jam. That's no, that's more proof that you know it's that big that they'll just call it NBA Jam, even yeah. though it's not even NBA Jam, or if it's you know just a you know if it's some other like a knockoff or something like that, it always yeah. goes back to NBA Jam. Um, yeah. There's a real great question over here from David Marsh in the chat about yeah. the documentary uh, Tilt: The Battle to Save Pinball, which covers the the WMS uh, the pinball uh, travails of the late '90s. And yeah, that's a, yeah. that's a really fun movie, a really great movie, and yeah, lots of uh, lots of uh, classic Williams Valley Midway people. Yeah, no, yeah. The uh, it's funny. Um, so I was sent that DVD when I first started the film, and I started watching most of it because I was I was around that time. That was when the, the um, the I believe it's called what the pinball two thousand concept was coming in. Was like mm -hmm. the um, uh, the pinball slash video at the same time. 
So I started watching. Most yeah, it was Star of it. Wars Episode One. That's it. Yeah, and so I started watching most of it, and I had to stop watching it because I didn't want it to influence what I was going to do because it was very close to it. And it, and and be, and granted, it was a pinball department, which is kind of separate from the video, anyways. Um, but thanks for reminding me because I need to get back on that. I literally just pulled it out of my uh, DVD collection the other day, so I need to go check it out. It's a fun movie. It's sad. It's all kind of sad when you think about it. Like, there's so many yeah. happy members associated with all this stuff. Yeah. But when you think that, like, I mean, all these people have moved on and all this stuff is going on, that you're like, okay, well, life goes on, I guess. Um, yeah. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's weird. Because, like, um, so people, like, I, I previewed the film for different people and I also previewed it for the people who are in the film. We had a cast and crew screening here in Chicago uh, quite a few months back. And um, it was interesting because my original ending to the film was was actually pretty sad and depressing, and I and I really liked it that way. But at the last minute, I kind of cut it down the middle. You can interpret it however you want to. But when I at the cast and crew screening at the end, like you know, these guys live these these moments, and they're like, "Man, you know, I really like your ending, but I just I feel so bummed out." <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, well, it's interesting because other people who who are quote unquote civilians who aren't, you know, who weren't part of that, you know, that whole company they watch and they're like, Oh, it's a nice ending. You know, it, it isn't like completely doom and gloom. So it just it right. matters on how you look at it. That's so true. That's so true. Yeah. It's always different being part of it. Was it hard to be part of the subject matter, but then also be part of the movie in a way like as in to be, yeah. you know, yeah, to be, to be on both sides of the camera and to some degree, even if you're not, you know, directly being interviewed in the movie, um, you know, to yeah. have that role. Yeah, it it was tough. Um, you know, going into it, my 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 me making the film, I always made a point. Of, uh, originally, I was going to just shoot the footage, um, you know, direct the interviews and things like that, and then I was going to have somebody else edit it because I felt like I might have been too close to the subject matter. Um, but it got to a certain point where I eventually ended up editing most of it myself. Um, and it was really tough to separate myself from a lot of things. And, you know, because I didn't want it to be too inside baseball. Like I knew so, I, I knew so much of the details that I felt like I had to put every detail in there. And I had a lot of early test screenings where the film was like four hours long, you know, I had super long rough cut and I put everything in there that I thought like needed to be in there, knowing that there, it was going to get cut out. And in viewing it with various people, um, it was really helpful to, look at it a different lens of okay i know we need to get these details in there but if if for somebody who didn't work at midway do, are they going to understand this are they going to be interested in it and then somewhere somehow try to either visually express it or have or condense information to get that detail in without being a long and laborious and that was a that was really tough it, the editing process took a lot longer than i thought it would take and at one point I actually took a break from the film for almost six months just to separate myself from it and then come back and re-edit it again. And that was, uh, that was a, that was probably like the last year of the film was just that, just restructuring it under just like, a, you know, a fresh palette. Yeah. It's, it's a blessing and a curse to have such great material, you know, where you just feel oh, like God. I got to put it all in. But then at the yeah. same time though, like, Realistically, nobody's going to watch a three and a half to four hour long movie, aside from the hardcores who would probably watch a five to six hour long movie. But I guess that's why, you know, that's why the extras are out there and, you know, director's cuts and things like that. That's it. That's exactly it. That's the only thing that that's the only thing that saved me mentally was knowing that they were going to the extras are going to live somewhere else, you know. But it was like ultimately, you know, somebody gave me great advice and, and it was basically you're making a documentary, not an encyclopedia. You know, so a documentary has to move. It has to tell the story, get people interested in it, and they feel like they've li had an experience and then they get out. And so, you know, it was a struggle getting it to around 100 minutes, but ultimately it's the best thing for it because it gets people excited and doesn't bore them. It's, you know, I come, I come from a, uh, a generations of restaurant families. And, uh, and one of the big things is if, if your customer leaves your restaurant, like full but wanting more, then that means they had a good meal. If they leave your restaurant completely bloated, feeling horrible, then that's you know you don't you, you, that's that's not necessarily a good thing. Yeah. Um, all right, Tanya asked a real great question earlier. Ooh, I really like this one. Did you take anything with you from Midway that you left or before you left that you weren't supposed to, uh, but you're thankful that you did? 
and that it ended up in the documentary. <laughs> so the, I'm not, I mean, I mean, I did like when I left Midway, I took the, the stuff that, you know, that I worked on like materials that, you know, that belonged to me and things like that. Um, you know, I don't know if I like whether I wasn't supposed to or not. I, that's kind of, kind of a gray area. I'll, let's just leave it at that and stuff. But like when Midway closed, um, you know, or let's say, yeah, it was like when Midway closed up with bankruptcy, like it was crazy. They they were literally throwing away tons and tons of stuff mm. into dumpsters, and and people had to, were like people got phone calls telling them, hey, get down the Midway and go get the salvage the stuff. I mean, that's how like that's how careless they were about it. So like for the film, um, you know, a, a a huge chunk of the archival material that's in the film was from Ken Fidesna, who went in with a mm. truck and rescued all these tapes out of the dumpster. And now they're at the Strong Museum in Rochester, New York. But like nobody cared about these things. They just tossed everything out. You know, there's like tons of material that John Tobias left behind when me and John left Midway. And like, we don't even know where most of the stuff is. It's crazy. That's, that's so funny. Yeah. And because when you think about it at the time, it's totally different from, from all these years later removed from it. Um, I remember, yep. yeah, I talked to Sal DeVito once and he told me the same thing. And he said that yeah, he had all these, I think it was like uh, NBA Jam kits or some stickers. It was something NBA Jam related. Yeah. He had all of these, tons of them, and he just tossed them out. He's like, no one needs this crap. Just tossed them out. Yeah, and yeah. whereas yeah. now, yeah. like you go on eBay, I mean, that could just be like an yeah. ongoing thing to just keep selling those. So it's... Um, yeah, it, there was like, yeah, there was no like, our, you know, back then and up until fairly recently, archi archiving stuff was not taken seriously at all. And so, yeah, I can tell you many times, even when I was working at Midway, where they were throwing out old arcade boards of like pigskin oh, and arch rival oh, and they're just tossing them in the trash. I know, oh, I know. It's painful. You know you so for this crowd, it's super painful. <laughs> you can't do that, huh? Yeah, no, but I think it also has to do with the fact that maybe video games have been looked at in greater respect over time. You know, it's one of those... I think so. I mean, it's, you know, and if you go back to the early 90s, you look how the news reports talked about video games, how little coverage there was that was yeah. something that wasn't salacious. I think it was kind of like a whole cultural attitude that went into that too. You know what I mean? As in this is just yeah. some kind of something disposable. It's a toy and they'll move on. There'll be more toys to come. Yeah, so, exactly. Exactly. It's a big change. So it's, yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, it, it, I think it's easier to archive now. Back then, it just, you know, like media was, you know, you, you, know, you had, that too. You know, yeah, CD ROMs. You didn't have DVD ROMs back then, right. so it was just a pain in the ass. Yeah, carrying on the floppy, holding on to floppy disks, and you know those little mini DVs. God, those are. Uh, yep. It's real. I remember also hearing that yeah, the original Dunks and NBA Jam were transferred from one office to the other on a floppy disk. Yeah, and I was just like, yeah. wow, a different era. <laughs> um, yeah. So Casey asks about the final runtime of the movie. Um, yeah. 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 So when when will the uh, the movie be coming out? Yeah. When will people in America have the opportunity to see it? Sure. Uh, so the final runtime is uh, 101 minutes, um, and it recently premiered uh, in Australia at the Australian Documentary Film Festival. It's, it's the next film festival will be the San Francisco Doc Film Fest. So when it comes out in the U.S., we're still not sure yet because um, this whole COVID thing kind of like screwed up our entire film festival run. And so the idea was that it was going to come out after the summer film fest. Now all the film festivals are online and they've been delayed into fall. So we're kind of running our course through that. And right now it, it is going through cargo film releasing for international sales. So we don't have this, we don't have like the distinct dates just yet, but we're looking into uh, probably late fall at this point. Um, but yeah, we'll keep everyone, you know, updated. You know, if you, if you go to insertcoindoc.com, um, there'll be you know, information up there. And like I said, it's going through like three or four more film festivals. Um, so the San Francisco Doc Fest, it's region locked uh, for anybody in California to see. So if you live in California, you, you'll be the next ones up to be able to see it. Cool. Um, all right. Now I want to get into something real nerdy that is close to okay. my heart. So the classic middle secrets. Um, so of course there was the whole rumor that Adam Bomb was in WF WrestleMania, but then he wasn't. And then yes. you posted the footage on, I think it was Instagram first, maybe, or maybe it was Twitter first, whichever one. Um, yeah. you, you posted it, and I was like, wow, this is a real thing. And as a hardcore Midway head, I had never seen this before. Yeah, um, yeah was, this, is, this is so special. Not, yeah, so – oh, go ahead. I'm sure if you – no, yeah, no, no, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's so funny. Like, I, I never really thought about the whole atom bomb thing until people started talking about it. And, um, and, 
you know, I just forgot that he was in the game to be honest, to be quite honest with you. And so, but yeah, like, you know, the, the WWF WrestleMania was the first game that I worked on um, at Midway. So it's very near and dear to my heart. And yeah, and Adam Baum was one of the characters that we had in the game, but he ended up getting cut for numerous reasons. But one of the most is just we ran out of time and ROM space on there. But like, yeah, I recently found, you know, footage of this. I'm not sure if you can see this or not. I can, yeah. But that, yeah, oh. so that's me getting slammed with Adam Baum. So, so this, Sal DeVito. Oh, that's awesome. Sent, <laughs> yeah, so Sal DeVito recently sent me um, tapes from WWF, WrestleMania. I had a handful, but he had all of them. And so I found like four hours of Adam Baum doing his moves. And so, yeah, so I'm, di I'm digitizing them now and, uh, you know, for Sal and such. And, you know, either one of us will probably end up, uh, you know, releasing it. People love that stuff. I mean, Adam Bomb in particular yeah. with a lot of the stuff, like you've seen bits and pieces, but Adam Bomb is one of those that's, yeah, that's not out there. Oh, this is a good question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From Brian. Yeah. Did you guys do any fatalities besides The Undertaker? Yeah. The Undertaker, I think, sends somebody into a casket and they go under the ring or something. They disappear. Um, yeah, yeah. Were there any other fatalities in WrestleMania? Yeah. There, there, there were plans of it, but it was never, and Sal might, might have a, uh, more clear story but the, from what i remember we were planning on everyone having fatalities so if you look at the special moves like doink has a giant hammer you know and raises giant razors and things like that they were always planned but russell the the wrestlemania game went so long uh, it just you know it just took forever to do that uh, we just ran out of time so the only one that really got finished was the undertaker um, none of the other ones were really programmed in you know like okay. one one thing that yeah you know it like in, even in the Mortal Kombat games, in the early ones, the fatalities were kind of reusing a lot of moves that were already in there. And so that was always the plan was, oh, well, we just reuse what we have, chop it up until we get a nice fatality. But it just we, we just never got around to it. One of the, the things I really loved about Midway was that they would just sort of mess with your mind as a gamer. Like, as you know, if you're going out there, yeah. they'll sometimes tell you that something's out there when it isn't or it might be or they'll add it later yep. on. So there's all these little bits and pieces of things that never existed but almost existed. Um, so is there anything yeah. in the realm of Atom Bomb or anything like this, like deep cut kind of stuff where like this character was supposed to be there, that team was supposed to be on there, this hidden character. Was there anything else like that that really jumps to mind from that era of Midway that was just scrapped and just, you know, it was tossed into, it was just, you know, you guys had to move on to the next one. Was there anything else besides that, like Atom Bomb over here? Boy, man, that's a good question. I mean, it's, you know, not, yeah, there's going to be a disappointing answer, but not really. You know? And the reason I say is, uh, it's a bit disappointing in that is that these games are so lean and mean to begin with. There's very little room for error because it's not like nowadays where you have a hard drive or a CD you know, or, you know, or, or a disc you know, medium or anything like that. These were, you know, ROM chips. And so they only had so much space right. in them. So we plan, we plan accordingly, you know, so, you know, like the fact that Adam Bomb, let's say, can make it in, it was basically because we just ran out of room. It wasn't like we had three other characters that we were also trying to cram in, also. Right. You know, so um, it was all about that space. And it wasn't until later on when the hard drives came in that suddenly you can do, you know, a lot more stuff going in. But, you know, I mean, I think the big one was the whole Michael Jordan thing, you know, for NBA Jam. And that's still an answer to this day. You know, obviously that's going to like, it's like the Holy Grail oh, yeah. for, you know, for some for some arcade people um but most everything else in terms of easter eggs you know there are there are little hidden things here and there but n nothing that was like you know major because it's like again we, we had to be very economical to begin with absolutely absolutely it's so weird to just even imagine the idea of midway releasing dlc like midway in the dlc era would have been very different you know it's just strange to think about it because yeah you know, as you're making updates and having to send out new ROMs and do a lot of work, I mean, a lot of physical work and a lot of arcade operators having to do work too, you know, you could just be able to download an update would probably have changed a lot of things. Okay. Yeah, no, definitely. I, and I think they were trying to work in that era, like towards the end when I was there, you know, around 98, 98, 99, they started doing, they started trying to get the uh, machines to be online. There was like WaveNet that was for Mortal Kombat yeah. 3 and stuff so people could play, you know, from one bowling alley to another, things like that. And that, you know, along with that would have came, you know, network updates and things like that. But it just, you know, it, it, by that point, the arcade era was already starting to die out. So just the investment wasn't worth it. Right. It just never happened. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, so you, you mentioned earlier, I think it, this was the number. You said, you said that you knew about 60% of the Midway store, but there was 40% that you didn't know. 
Um, yep. I think that was what it was. Yeah. So, so what were the, the biggest things that you didn't know, or what were the things that were most surprising for you about somebody who's, you know, you worked at the company, you were there, yeah. you know, these people. Well, you know what it is, is that, you know, like I, you know, I worked in the development end of things, you know, so I was with the creative people and such. And, you know, so I didn't really deal much with the business end. And so when I started interviewing people like Neil Nicastro and Ken Fidesz, and even Roger Sharp, getting to understand the economics of the arcade machines and how the whole arcade operation works from the developers to the distributors, to the operators and how money got divvied up. You know, I kind of had a vague idea of how that worked, but they, you know, that was something that, that I, I found super compelling. And so in the film itself, we really dig into the business side of things. And I think that's was something that people are going to be surprised by when they see the film. It's not a, Oh, you know, everything is about, the glory of the of the game and how these games, because they're so creative, they made so much money. That is the case, but fifty percent of it was the business of it, you know. And how do you sell it? How do you tweak the design so people drop in a quarter every forty five seconds? And uh, and I got really entranced by that. So a lot of people, when they see the film, they'll actually learn about like why games of that era were designed a certain way, and it was to maximize money. Absolutely. I think Eugene Jarvis is like the spitting image of this with, you know, what he talks about when it comes to Defender and how you're going to die within 30 seconds or less and things like that. And yeah, I mean, even the things that Mark Trammell would do on NBA Jam where he'd adjust the clock so it would run faster at certain times and then slower at others. It was, it's, it's so creative. Yeah. And I, yeah, it's, and it, of course, he's still doing stuff like that to this day, I'm sure, with, uh, with Zynga. If he's there, he's still, he's still messing around with things. Um, exactly. All right. There's a cool question here from, uh, from Marissa. Uh, Josh, who's your favorite talent to work with, both developer and talent-wise? Who's the best developer I worked with? Or sorry, what was the question again? Yeah, who's your favorite talent to work with, both developer and talent-wise? So maybe so, we can split up into two questions then. Yeah. yeah. All right. So developer-wise, so I just put up a picture. So like Mark and Sal, um, like I, you know, I loved working with them. You know, there were the, you know, there were, you know, they created NBA Jam. You know, they created, you know, WrestleMania. They they're the ones that started me in the business. So, you know, I had an incredible time working with them and it, and it was, it was really interesting. Like, you know, Mark Jermell at that point was already successful by the time I got to Midway, the first NBA jam had already come out. He was successful as, as a young person, you know, making games, you know, for the Commodore 64 and, and other uh, systems of the eighties. Um, but when I first went to Midway, you know, and worked for him, he like was just like the nicest guy always listen to suggestions. Yeah, he was he was never like, hey, I'm Mark Tamel, you know, don't tell me what to do. He was always, hey, tell me how do you feel about this game? How do you feel about this these tweaks and things like that? And so that really uh, made an impression on me that some that somebody that successful in what he does was such an was such a nice person and it was so giving and such. Um, and then at the same time Sal DeVita, you know, to this day, you know, still a great guy. You know, when we first met, you know, when you know when we first started working together, you know, he was just you know, a great personality, but he was very hardcore about his work. He expected excellence across the board, and I'd learn a ton from them. So, you know, like if they're not if they're not my favorite developers that, that I've worked with, they're definitely in the top like you know top three or top four and such. Um, but you know, th another person that I really I, I never worked with him directly, but I really admired was Eugene Jarvis. Um, I was already in awe of him from the Defender Robotron days, but seeing the way he um developed games like cruise in usa you know during the 90s and stuff hugely inspirational and once again an incredibly nice giving person um and a total mad genius eugene jarvis is so special i'm always amazed that more people don't know about eugene jarvis especially yeah. just as a personality he's just so striking and just the way that he curses every few minutes and comes up with these one-liners he's just so good I, I love me some eugene jarvis um, yeah 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 eugene uh, he himself has made like insert coin from PG to PG thirteen, possibly hard, just by the way he's talking. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Then you get the Eugene Jarvis cut, and then you, yeah, you just can't show it anywhere when that exactly. comes. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. All right. Let's see. All right, so we're coming up on time. Just a, just a couple more questions over here. Yeah, sure. Let's see. Um, yeah, we see one from over here from Joe. Um, how did Acclaim get away with doing clones slash pseudo sequels of midway titles like College Slam and WWF in Your House? So the the way the way the deal the deal worked with uh, Midway back in the day is that um, they Midway basically for a long time had the had, had the home rights 
to um, a lot of Midway's games up until like a certain year and then it expired. So, you know, so they, so like, like they ended up getting the NBA jam name. And, you know, if you talk to Mark Jamal, he has a story and I believe it's in your book, you know, about how, you know, you know, basically acclaimed more or less stole the NBA mm. jam name yeah. uh, from Midway. And um, so the, so acclaim had a relationship with Midway for quite some time. Um, but in, in terms of, uh, WWE or WWF at the time. Uh, what that was an interesting deal. What happened was that Acclaim had the license for WWF, and they came to Midway and mid, and asked Midway, "Hey, do you guys want to make an arcade game that will will li- will basically co license out to you guys, and then we'll do the home version of it?" So so that was always Acclaim's to begin with, and that was that ended up more or less being the last game for that that Midway did for Acclaim, and so. We made the game in Chicago. They did the arcade. Uh, they did the um, console port of it, and then they took all of our footage from WrestleMania and used that for In Your House, and then added on top of it. Um, I it's the funny thing is that I never saw In Your House until maybe a few years ago, and I was really like, yeah, and I didn't even know about it to be I, it was like because after WrestleMania I went off to do other things, and um, and so I didn't really pay attention to it, and so when I saw In Your House a few years, I was like. Like man, they murdered our sprites. Like me and yeah. Sal, me and Sal like worked on those sprites so hard, and they just murdered them. And then they shot their own footage. And this is nothing against the people that claim, but you know, because they had limitations yeah. with their hardware. It's not the same. Yeah, yeah. But oh my gosh, it's like uh, to this day, I really wish when people made digi- make digitized fighting games, they would just ask one of us what the secret sauce was. Because there are certain things that we did to make them look really good, make them move and look really good. And everybody seems to just not be able to figure that out. So, so it shows my heart out when I see that. Yeah. I always found Acclaim to be very shrewd. I feel like if Acclaim saw that there was a really good idea, then they were like, okay, this is a good idea. Let's roll with it. Let's make more of it. Let's make some money. And yeah, yeah like I was thinking of that Batman Forever game. Do you remember that? They had an arcade yeah. game they put out that, yep. that all just collapsed. Yeah, it was a digitized game. And I remember being, it was kind of cool, but it was just totally, it was clearly Midway influence. As in, I don't think a claim would have ever dipped their toes into digitization if Midway hadn't come along and just, you know, just created these huge franchises with it. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, it's like, we, you know, I have a lot of pride in what we did in Midway in terms of the digitization stuff. Like we really took a lot of care and people would be shocked by how much handcrafting there was. It wasn't like we just put people in the front of video camera and shot them and that was it. There was just a lot of manipulation done. To make them as good as possible so um, yeah <laughs> yeah all right so let's uh let's fast forward to when you left midway so that was yep. 1999 right yeah yep that so, 99 so yeah so that was like when me john tobias and dave mikitich uh left uh, from our own company so at that point did you feel like the writing was on the wall that midway was not going to survive that long i mean at that point still midway had another 10 years to go but yeah. when you consider that williams went back decades and decades and there was all this history did you think that Midway was not long for this world by the time you were leaving? It was. I mean, I think it was partly that. I, you know, I think like each of us had different reasons for for leaving. And for myself personally, um, you know, I it wasn't so much the writing on the wall on arcade games it was because at that point, me like me and John Tobias were already working on like the home Mortal Kombat adventure type game. So we're already doing home games at Midway. We were the only home game team at the at the Chicago office. So we're already dipping our toes into the home market. Um, but I think, you know, for myself, it was, how do I put this? I felt like there was a glass ceiling already in place. Like I had gotten up to a certain point, um, but there were a lot of people right. that were in charge at Midway that there's no, they weren't going to go anywhere. You know what I mean? And so career wise, I looked right. at it, I was like, well, you know what, if I really want to advance my career, it's, you know, I've got, I felt like I, I got to where I needed to go midway. The rest of it was going to be very tough to break through that. And so it just, you know, and called this useful exuberance at the time. But it was like, you know what? The best way to break that glass ceiling is just make your own ceiling, you know? So let's form our own company and and do that. And looking back on it in hindsight, like that was the best decision. It wasn't an easy decision by any means, but I just felt like, you know what? It's There's so much going on outside of midway. You know, midway in many ways, you know, it was like a bubble. Like we were on our own island. You know, like I said, we're Lord of Flies and such. And um, and I just felt like the growth wasn't going to be there. You know, moving forward. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, so I mean, but even by the time you left in '99, the the glory days were pretty much over. You know, like it was a different era coming in. Yeah, the home game era. There were some great, some good games that came out of it, but it was a di very different style of era. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. It, 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 so and again, the, it, it's yeah, and it, it was one of those things where you know it it, it was going to be hard for a lot of us to really like you know flip our brains and make 40 hour long games you know and to this day that's still really not my style um so yeah it was you know and as we see in the 2000s midway kind of had some issues you know getting into that yeah um all right so last big question i'm going to ask you which sure. is a, a theory that i've heard from a few different uh, or at least from a couple of different people that worked at midway okay which was that if midway survived they would be able to uh um they'd be making mobile games uh if midway was still around would they be making mobile games right so th that i that's a bit tough to say um i would say that you know the um i would say that like certain people you know i mean termel is making mobile games now which is like perfect for them i think you know the way midway's team was i think the game designers would have done some more mobile games um but you know it's easy to say that mobile games and arcade games are very similar, but like the way mobile games are, they're the way monetized is slightly different. So would Midway be like that? I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I can't say for sure. It seemed like it would be a natural. Um, Casey, I saw your question earlier. Let's see, it was about, yeah. So in regards to the jam thing, I saw your question on that. So yeah, I know that Mark has said that there, because I know the story about like the early ROMs with your not it and such, uh, which is probably, true um but at the same time like every time i've talked talk to talk to termel about it he says he has it but he can never seem to bring it up and so i'm hoping it's true you know but i'm uh i'm slightly skeptical about it myself and this is me you know talking with termel all the time so i keep telling him i like, do it if it's true you need to just get that out there you know and uh and show people so we'll see we'll see what happens yeah, no, yeah, Casey, he should like he should crowdfund cleaning his store. He no, like I said, he he tells me that he has the ROMs that he wants to just get them transferred. So uh, we'll we'll see what happens. Um, but you know, market Mark, yeah, I have no reason to think that he's not telling the truth. But I just hope that he just gets this over with so people can get off my back. <laughs> uh, but thank you, everybody, and and please go to uh, insertcoindoc.com and um you know for more information on the documentary thank you very much